I want to begin, I've tried to get around as most of you as I could to thank you for being here. Um, I, what I'm, I really have two goals tonight. Uh, one is to encourage you, and then hopefully number two is to challenge you as many of you as I possibly can. Uh, but I do want to encourage you. Um, if I could give you, just right off the bat, two things to, to be mindful of. Number one, God, God sees you. Uh, I know that so often when you teach in a small group, uh, we call ours connect groups at Spotswood. I guess you call them the same thing here, whether you're in preschool, children, students, or adults. There are many times when you're faithfully doing the work that you wonder if anybody knows. And I know it's hard because, as I'll explain in a moment, I'm also a connect group leader. Uh, I know there are times when you wonder if anybody really sees what you're doing. I, you just need to know, number one, God sees. He knows. He sees you when you're there preparing that lesson. He sees you when you're ministering to that student or that class member, that group member that's struggling. He sees you when you're praying for your group members. He sees. He knows. And then two, he, he really wants to use you. He really does. And uh, I hope that when you leave here tonight, you'll walk away refreshed, encouraged, and that little spark that, that you have to, to do what you do right now will catch flame. And you'll be passionate about what you do. I love teaching small groups. My wife and I have a small group at 1130 at Spotswood, Young Empty Nesters. And uh, I, love, I love leading a small group. I can't think of a more exciting place to be than at 1130 in Mobile Unit 1 at Spotswood Baptist Church where I get to be at the intersection of God's Word and lives and see transformation take place. Uh, I've seen marriages changed as God's Word has been applied to that relationship. I've seen lives totally transformed as people have begun to understand and learn God's truth and apply it to their lives. It's exciting, no matter what age you're teaching. So I just want to encourage you tonight, and again, like I say, challenge you. So I want to pray, and then I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more to you, and then we'll jump into what I came to share with you tonight. Heavenly Father, I just want to pause and thank you for each of the leaders that are here, each of the men and women who have taken time out of their Friday evening to be here on this campus. And Lord, I pray that the time that they've invested will be uh, given back to them. And that, Father, this time tonight will be profitable for the kingdom and will encourage them and challenge them. Thank you, Lord, for their investment in your kingdom work as small group leaders, as connect group leaders. Uh, and Lord, I just pray your Holy Spirit would bless this time and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I am a minister of education at Spotswood Baptist Church. I've been there for 23 years. Uh, when I came to Spotswood Baptist Church, we run about 500 in small groups. We called it Sunday school back then. Uh, now we've, we've grown to a point we have about 1,700 in our small groups, about 150 small groups on a Sunday morning. So we've seen God move in a great way at Spotswood. But I'm not just a minister of education, and I love doing what I've, I do. I really do. Uh, and because I love doing what I do, I te like I said, I do teach a small group. I, I do that because if uh, it's, I c again, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do on a Sunday morning. Um, and I realize uh, what a great opportunity I have to impact lives as a small group leader. So I do that and also keeps me fresh as I train my leaders because I know exactly what they're going through. And I'm not just teaching them from a textbook. I'm teaching them from personal experience, real life experience. So that's pretty cool. I'm not only a minister of education, not only a connect group leader, I am also a husband. Um, my wife is with me. This is Valerie. Would you welcome her? This is Valerie, my wife. <laughs> Almost 30 years, and I don't need anybody coming up to me afterwards saying, hey, dude, man, you married way up. I know that. I get that. I outpunted my coverage. I know all that stuff, yes. Uh, but we've been married for almost 30 years. We dated for six years before that. It took me six years to get her, for her to get me to say yes. Um, but uh, no, but uh, I chased her for six years, so we've known each other for, for a long time. Uh, so I'm a minister of education. Uh, I'm a connect group leader. Uh, I am a, a husband, uh, but I'm also a dad. And uh, we have three kids. Uh, they're all gone, so we're empty nesters, and we're loving it. This is awesome. This is a great stage of life. Uh, and it allows her now to travel with me when I speak. It used to be I took my kids with me, my daughters. Uh, both my daughters have traveled with me. Uh, one daughter all over the one time all over the state of Virginia. We did about 12 different uh, uh, conferences uh, with the SBCV one year, and she traveled with me to all of those. Uh, I joke with my daughters; they could both be ministers of education uh, if they wanted to be, because they've sat in so many of these type of meetings and training sessions. But uh, we have three kids. 
Uh, our oldest is Amber. She's married to John Spolino. And uh, they're church planning up in D.C. They have Mercy Hill Church. Check it out online, Mercy Hill Church, D.C. I think it's mercyhilldc.org or something like that. Uh, they just planted a church in September, so it's just a few months old. Uh, and they've got a handful of people that they're reaching up there. They're within walk. How many have been to the Bible Museum? And, and there you, do you even know the Bible Museum, Museum exists? There is a Bible Museum that opened up, I think it was in November. In D.C., it's eight stories tall. It would literally take you days to go through all of it. If you ever get a chance to get to D.C. and check that out, it is worth the trip. It is an amazing, uh, amazing museum. In fact, I believe this is accurate based on the number of artifacts they have. It's the largest museum in D.C., which is saying something. But they live two blocks from that. They live within walking distance of the Capitol. They live in the southwest waterfront district of D.C., right in the city. So pray for Mercy Hill, pray for John and Amber Spolino. My middle child's my son. He's married to Danny. They live in San Antonio. They graduated. All my kids went to Liberty. Um, I went to Liberty. So we got close ties to that. I know based on my, my degrees and their degrees, we've probably had a good investment in a number of those buildings that you see going up. Um, but uh, they're, they're, uh, she's in the Air Force. She was an ROTC at Liberty, so they're in the Air Force. She's in San Antonio. So those, uh, any military in here served, presently serving? God bless you guys. Thank you for your service. First time we've had a family member in the military. So this is a learning experience for us. But she serves at Randolph Air Force Base as a personnel officer. And uh, they attend Castle Hills Baptist Church here outside of San Antonio. My youngest is Elisa. And uh, she lives in Orlando with a young man who graduated from Virginia Tech. I saw some Virginia Tech jackets out here. Um, and uh, he's a Hokie, whatever that is. I still don't know what that is, but he's a Hokie. And he's an a, a aerospace engineer. Uh, apparently a great degree, right? Because he had all kinds of job interviews, Texas, Florida. But he took one at Cape Canaveral, and he, he works down there to live outside of Orlando and uh, doing well. They're part of Merritt Island Baptist Church, plugged into a young marriage group there, doing, uh, doing very well. We're excited how God is using them. And then we also have a new stage of life. John and Amber have a little boy. I wanted you to see him. This is Jonathan. Seriously, he is one awesome little dude. I love, how many grandparents we got out there? Man, is it not the most amazing time of your life, right? Also one of the most expensive times of my life, too, I'm learning. I thought once I get rid of my kids, I wouldn't have to be spending money on anybody. Now it's, now it's a grandkid, and my wife is constantly shopping for him. Uh, but there's another, I think, another picture up there of him. Uh, there he is. Um, that's, that's little Jonathan. He's two years old. And uh, fortunately, he just lives an hour north of us. Uh, our church, Spotswood Baptist Church, I don't think I told you, is located in Fredericksburg. It's about three hours and 42 minutes from here driving time. Uh, so we had a chance to drive down here. We were shocked. We drove down south to see snow. We don't have snow up there. You guys have snow down here. It's the wildest thing. So. But what a beautiful area around Smith Mountain Lake. We have stayed at Smith Mountain Lake on the northern side with our kids a number of years ago. I've been to this church. Um, I spoke to the Sunday school leaders. I guess it was Sunday school leaders back then. It's probably been about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, we pulled in here. I said, babe, I've been here before. I recognize this place. So, but 10, 10 or 11 years ago, I had a chance to come down here. One of the things that I've learned, though, is a result of being a parent, uh, probably one of the most transforming truths that uh, really impacted me as a parent is when I finally learned and understood for the very first time that I am my children's primary discipler. How many moms and dads are here as tough kids at home? A number of you. You need to hear and learn and understand what I learned and understood, uh, not till really later in my parenthood but to understand that my primary responsibility with my kids was not just to make sure they grew up and could take care of themselves and someday get a job and, and, and fend for themselves out in the world. My primary responsibility as a, as a dad was to disciple them, to disciple them to Christ and then to disciple them to pursue Christ the rest of their lives. That meant my win as a parent changed. It wasn't just that they could fend for themselves and take care of themselves and move out of the house. A win for me as a, as a dad was when they came to Christ and got baptized and then to see them as adults now plugged into a church and living for the sake of the gospel and pursuing Christ. That's a win. And now I'm learning as a grandparent that my primary job as a grandparent is not to spoil that little boy. Although I love doing that. Don't you love him? I love, I love, to, I love to give him M&Ms. He loves M&Ms. His mommy doesn't like that, but that's okay. <laughs> I love to spoil a little guy and, and send him home, right? We can do that. But that's not my primary job. My primary job with Jonathan is, even now, 
to help him understand that there's a God that loves him. And someday when he's old enough to understand that, that sin separates him from that God that loves him, and that, that God that loves him sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and to die on the cross so that he could have a relationship with Jonathan. And the win for me as a granddad is not that Jonathan loves me, but that Jonathan loves God. And so it is really seriously changed. And to be honest with you, it made parenthood a whole lot more exciting. I remember if my son, I, I took my son one summer and we, we got up early in the morning. I made it, that was hard with a teenager. I had him get up early in the morning with me and I said, boy, we're going to get up in the morning. We're going to read the Bible together. We're going to pray. Because I want you to learn how to, how to do that, how to have a quiet time, how to spend time with God and, and, and take my kids with me on ministry opportunities, but to teach our kids to love God. The ultimate goal for me as a parent was to multiply myself. Because listen to me, my three kids will do much more for the sake of the kingdom than I ever will. Because now, Lord willing, there's three of me running around who love God and are going to pursue him with the rest of their lives. And I can't wait to see what God does through them. And I can't wait to multiply myself in the life of Jonathan and the rest of my grandkids. Because you see, I don't want to just live a life. I want to leave a legacy. I want my life to out, I want my, my, the effect of my life to outdistance my life. And I want to challenge you tonight not just as a small group leader, but I want to challenge you as a follower of Christ. Don't just live a life. Leave a legacy. I have a little quote I, I, I put down that's really um, motivated me, and really it's really a question, will your ministry outdistance your life? Will your ministry outdistance your life. And I want you to have that question just rolling around in the back of your mind tonight as we spend this time together. Because I want to share you tonight how that can happen. How your ministry can outdistance your life. And it happens through multiplication. If you've got your hand out there, pull that out. And I want to, first of all, walk you through three things. The, the why of multiplication. Why we should multiply. Secondly, what we should multiply. And then thirdly, how we do it and try to get as practical as I can about how we multiply. Why we multiply, what we multiply, and how we multiply. We'll never get through all of this, I promise you that. And if you're interested in the notes when we're done, you can send me my email address is on the back of your form. You can send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint. But uh, I think it's important, first of all, to know why. So if you have your hand out, let me walk you through that. Number one, the why of multiplication, the power of multiplication, the power of multiplication. In the wall of the Museum of Natural History, this is in Chicago, there is a display on the wall. And that display has 64 squares in the lower left-hand square of those 64 square, square is some grains of wheat. And beside that, beside that display is this question. If you double the amount of wheat as you go from square to square, how, many would you, how much wheat would you have when you get to the 64th square? Interesting question. We may come up with all kinds of answers. Maybe we would have enough wheat to fill a, make a car load, or maybe we'd have enough wheat to have a train load of wheat. Here's the correct answer. This may surprise you. You'd have enough wheat after 64 squares of multiplication to cover the country of India six feet deep in grains of wheat. That, my friend, is the power of multiplication. Let me give you another example. If you take a, a normal piece of paper, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you were to fold it not once, once or twice or three times but you were to fold it 50 times how tall would that piece of paper be? The power of multiplication. Would it be as tall as a refrigerator? Would it be tall as, as, as a, a building? The correct answer is it would be tall enough to take you to the moon and back. That's mind boggling but that's a power of multiplication. Another example is using the illustration of compound interest. If I gave you the choice of either giving you a million dollars today or simply giving you a penny today and then allowing you to double the amount of pennies you have every single day for a month, which would you choose? The penny or the million dollars? It's tempting to choose the million dollars, right? That's a lot of money. But if you chose the penny, guess how much money you would have? Not a million. You'd have $5 million if you chose the penny. That's the power of multiplication. Let me give you another example. Let's take a, a spiritual 
uh, look at multiplication. If you were to take an evangelist and he were to lead a thousand people to Christ a day, I understand that seems unrealistic. That seems like an extraordinary number of people to reach, but let's say he could. And he reached a thousand people a day. How long would it take him to reach the whole world with the gospel? The answer is 15,000 years. 15,000 years, a thousand people a day. But if you were to take one person and he were to reach a person for Christ and spend a year with that person discipling him, the next year they would each go find somebody and disciple somebody themselves for a year. And then after that year, they each would go find somebody. And you could continue to multiply that process. Someone leads somebody to Christ, disciples them. Then they go out and each goes find somebody else and disciples them and multiplies. How long would it take you to reach the whole world for Christ? Not 15,000 years. 37 years. 37 years. We could reach the whole world with the gospel. That's the power of multiplication. There is power in multiplication, but that's not the only reason why we should multiply. Notice number two, it's the plan of God. It's the plan of God. You look in the Word of God and you find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, that the first command that God gave to Adam, when he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, was what? Be fruitful and what? Multiply. Do you remember when Noah got off the ark in Genesis chapter 9? You read in verse 7, the command that God gave to Noah was this. Be fruitful and and multiply. And then he repeats himself and says, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Every living thing, every living organism that God has ever created has within it the power to multiply as cells reproduce themselves. If you can remember back to ninth grade biology class, you remember that. It's the, it's the plan of God. It's how God works. But that's not the only thing. The power of multiplication, the plan of God, and then thirdly, notice it's a path of growth. Specifically, let's just apply it to church. It's how we grow as a church. We grow through the power of multiplication. You notice on your handout there, I've got the, a couple st uh, sections there. One is addition. The other is multiplication. What I want to do is illustrate it through small groups. Notice the first statement there. Existing classes reach their maximum growth potential and stagnate after 18 to 24 months. Every small group that gets created, it begins to grow. And the life cycle of a small group, and I know this not just because I read it in a book, because I'm a, but because I'm a small group leader and because I'm a minister of education with over 23 years of experience, this is what happens. Every group that happens after 18 to 24 months, the group begins to stagnate. It stops growing. And we'll get into the reasons for that in a moment. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just a reality. Number two, establish relationships and the Lego effect. Make it harder for new people to connect to that group. How many of you, are, you know what Legos are? We all know what Legos are, right? Many of you have probably stepped on a Lego at night. Remember when your kids used to say, oh, there's nothing more painful than a Lego, right, in the middle of the night. To, that'll wake you up. But the Legos only have so many connecting points on them, right? You remember how the Legos work? Once you've used up all the connecting points on the Lego, there's, there's no more Legos you can connect to that Lego. You're done. Every person that moves that comes into a church is like a Lego. They have so many connecting points. And in their church long enough, they, they, they develop this relationship and that relationship. They connected to this ministry and that ministry. Some of you are there. If somebody asks you to make another friend or to connect to another ministry, you're like, dude, all my connecting points are taken up. You know exactly what I'm talking about, the Lego principle. What usually happens in a group that's 18 to 24 or months in age or longer, usually the folks have been together long enough, been in the church long enough. When a new person comes into that group, they're, they're new to the church. They're new to the group. They got all kinds of connecting points. But they walk into that group and they're trying to connect to, to, the, to the people in the group. What they find out is everybody in there, all their connecting points are taken up. They don't, they don't have room for another relationship. It's not a bad thing, but it's a reality. And so because of that, New people have a hard time connecting to groups. Number three there, the people fall through the cracks. The bigger groups get, people fall through the cracks. But notice the, the, the difference multiplication makes. Notice, first of all, new, new beginnings create excitement. And when I'm talking about multiplication of groups, I'm talking when you just birth new groups. We'll talk about this a little bit more as we move forward, but at spots where we don't talk about dividing groups, splitting groups. In fact, it, it, my kids grew up in our home, they knew those were bad words. 
Those are curse words. You never use those words. Uh, if I had somebody in our church talk about splitting a group or dividing a group, if I stop them right there, bad words, bad words. We don't use those. Those have negative connotations. No, we birth new groups. We start new groups. But when that happens, there's excitement. You ever been around, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, when a, when a baby's been born? I've been there, right? I have three kids. There's nothing more exciting in the world than to see new life begin. Same is true in a church. Multiplication brings excitement. Number two, new groups grow more quickly than existing classes. They grow more quickly. Number three, new groups create better learning environments. You're going to have better learning experiences in smaller groups. You're in smaller groups. You can lose more, use more learning and, and teaching methods. You can be more creative. You can be more focused as a teacher. It's easier to prepare a lesson when you have a smaller group. The bigger the group is, the harder it is to do that. And your, your teaching methods... Uh, become limited. It's a better learning environment. Number four, new groups are easier for newcomers to assimilate into. Again, if you get new groups, people aren't. Uh, the Lego effect, they don't have to have some connecting points. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Number five, new groups can focus on target groups. As you birth and multiply groups, you're allowed to be focused on groups maybe not reaching. Um, I can tell, I'll give you illustrations at Spotswood. I remember it was not that long ago probably been about eight years ago, we, had, uh, we realized we weren't, weren't reaching as many young marriages as we should be and wanted to be. And so my wife and I decided we're going we're gonna to start a, a young marriage group, really from what we call paper classes, grab some prospects, call them, say, hey, we're starting a group, come join us. And we did that and got some young marriage, got started growing that group and then birthed a group out of that and another group out of that. And within a period of four or five years, we had eight small groups, young marriage small groups out of that, just one group. And then when you look at Spotswood, you saw a lot more young Marys than we've ever seen before. So multiplication gives you a chance to focus on target groups. Number six, new groups create opportunities for more people to use their spiritual gifts. Every time you birth a new group, whether it's a preschool group or a children's group or a student's group or an adult group, you create opportunities for more people to use their spiritual gifts and to serve. If you keep the same number of groups you have today, next year, that means you just need the same number of leaders you needed the year before. But every time you birth groups, you create more opportunities for people to serve. Let me give you a couple principles. I'm going to help you just really simple applications of this uh, uh, as far as growth. Equip you to be a minister of education. One is what we call the law of ten. The law of ten states this. For every ten groups, or every group, every number, the number of groups you have, you multiply them by ten. And that's generally what you're going to run in attendance. For instance, if you have 15 small groups... If you look at your attendance, you're probably going to run somewhere around 150. It may be 135. It may be 165. It's going to be around 150. Everywhere I've shared this principle, I've never seen anyone refute it when they just sit down and start counting the number of groups, preschool through adults. Mm -hmm. That's about how many we have. Spots, we've got about 100 now, but 160 plus groups. So we run about between 1,600, 1,700, getting close to 1,800, but that's how, many, that's how it works. So the law of 10 teaches me this. If I want to, if I want to go from 150 to 200... How many small groups do I need? Not a trick question. How many? I need 20, right? It's not rocket science. And so as a, as a church, if I want to grow and I want to reach more people, I need more small groups. As long as I have 15 groups, I'm only reaching 150 people. Now, I may try to cram as many people as I can into those 15 groups, but after a period of time, you're still going to have 150 people. That's the, that's the, the law of 10. Another one is what we call the pyramid theory. The pyramid theory, if you notice the pyramid up on the screen, you take the side, that's attendance on the bottom of the pyramid is what we call the organization. When I came to Spotswood, and this has been 23 years ago, we used to have a lot of high attendance days. You ever been a part of a high attendance day? They're not a bad thing. We used to do them. We used to do Friend Day and Operation Andrew, and we'd have these big pushes for a big attendance on a particular Sunday, and we would have a bigger crowd. I mean, we'd do, I'd do crazy things, like we'd reach the crowd, I'd shave my head or color my hair, all kinds of goofy things, right? And the crowd, people would show up, people would invite. But what normally happens on a high attendance day the week after, and certainly by two weeks after, anybody know what happens? Attendance goes right back to where it was. Isn't that frustrating? I used to irritate me. We'd do all that work and invite all those people, but there was no lasting impact from a high attendance day. And then I learned the principle of the, of the pyramid principle. The way you grow your small group ministry is not by pushing for attendance, but by simply growing the base of that pyramid. Because the, the bigger the base gets, the bigger the pyramid gets. And by default, the side gets bigger and longer, right? You follow me on this? So what I began to focus is just on the base. 
And so all I'm going to do from this point moving forward is I'm going to make, I'm going to create as many groups as I can. I'm going to find as many people who are willing to teach and train them, make them small group leaders, create new groups. And we grew from back then only 50 groups maybe to now 150, 160 groups. And all I did is get birthing groups and finding leaders and go after prospects and spots would begin to grow. It's called the pyramid principle. And so if you want your church to grow, you've got to grow the organization. It's a pyramid principle. Very simple principle, but it works. Um, here's an interesting study I think that I want to show you before we go any further as far as the power of small groups. You may not know this. There was research done by Lifeway. It's in one of the books that came out a couple years ago. But this is research done on the difference between people who are in small groups and people that aren't. Notice the difference in the percentage of the people that read their Bible and study their Bible. It's pretty amazing. Those that read the Bible, 27% of the people not in groups do. But if you get people in a group, in a small group, in a connect group, it jumps up to 67%. Number of people not just reading their Bible but studying their Bible it goes from 10% to 42%. I don't know about you, but if I was a pastor, it would excite me to know that 67% of my people are reading their Bible that 42% of the people are studying their Bible. That means if I were a senior pastor, I would do everything I could, could to get everybody in my church in a connect group. That's why you as a connect group leader, you need to find anybody that's not in a group, get them in a group. Why? Because the chances are they're going to be reading their Bible and studying their Bible. Praying for the status of unbelievers, 35 to 60, significant relationships in the church, 57 to 89, using spiritual gifts, 42 to 73. Notice the next slide. This is interesting. I know these aren't big numbers, but there's a big difference statistically between these. But notice the number of people that share their faith, 0.6 to 2.3. That's a huge jump. Huge jump. Number of people un, uh, invited unchurched to church service, 0.8 to 3.8. Percent to give their income to a, to a church, 6 to 10. Again, the difference between a person not being in a group and a person being in a small group, in a connect group, is amazing. What you're doing is important. Did you hear me? What you're doing is critically important to the health of this church. It is vital. And I, and I choose that word specifically, vital. It is critical. That you get as many people as you can possibly get who attend Franklin Heights and every single one of those campuses in a connect group. That's why there isn't a person that passes me no matter where, especially on a campus on Sunday morning. If I don't know them, I'm, inv I'm introducing myself to them. And the first question I ask them is, are you in a connect group? And the reason is, if they're not, then they're probably not reading the Bible. They're probably not studying the Bible. They're not inviting people. They're not sharing their faith. They're not using their spiritual gifts. I've got to get them in a connect group. The importance of getting people connected to a connect group. Number, next on your sheet there, number four, the promise of legacy. Why should we multiply? Why is it important? Yeah, it's a plan of God. There's power in it. But not only that, it's a difference of leaving a legacy or not. You see, if you're a small group leader, don't let the sum total of your ministry as a small group leader simply be gathering people together on Sunday and hearing you talk. Can I be really transparent with you? That is the summation of most small group leaders. Their ministry can be summed up in that statement. They just simply gathered people together on Sunday morning to hear them talk. I don't want that to be the summation of my ministry as a connect group leader. I don't want to just live a life. I want to leave a legacy. His name is Tim Shaw. Tim Shaw had been in our church for probably 10 or 12 years. But Tim Shaw's ministry continues at Spotswood Baptist Church. There are men that Tim Shaw, who was a connect group leader 10 or 12 years ago, he left our church to go to seminary. Now he's a minister of education at Apex Baptist Church in Apex, North Carolina, doing a great job. But his ministry continues on. His legacy continues on at Spotswood because there are men who are teaching today who came out of his group who he poured himself into. He multiplied himself as a leader. He left a legacy. I want to challenge you to do that. Listen, I can, I can tell you men and even women who led groups at Spotswood Baptist Church. I can, I can tell you about people who had huge groups, 30, 40 people come Sunday to hear them teach. And they, got, they, they moved or something happened and they're no longer teaching. I promise you within months, most people couldn't even remember them. Within a year or two, nobody even knew they were there. Because the sum total of their ministry was gathering people together to hear them talk. Don't just live a life. Leave a legacy. <laughs> I wrote this statement down here. I said, just clone yourself. 
You know, if you're a preschool teacher, you ought to clone yourself. You ought to have somebody teaching with you who you're teaching how to teach preschoolers. So someday when, when Mark and Mark, isn't that funny? Mark, Mark, and Bobby. you got a bunch of Bobbies and a bunch of Marks here, right? That makes it so easy. But when, when Mark and Mark and Bobby come to you and say, you know, we need to birth a new preschool class, and you got somebody right there who's ready to go teach because you poured yourself into the, you cloned yourself as a preschool teacher. They know what it's like to prepare a preschool lesson. They know what it's like to love on preschoolers. They know what it's like to, to, to teach preschoolers. But clone yourself. Don't just live a life. Leave a legacy. Let me very quickly to what of multiplication. It's okay. I get it. I get it. Multiplication is important. I understand that. So what do we need to multiply? Well, number one, the first thing we need to multiply is disciples. Disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, we all know that, right? The Great Commission. Many of us could quote the Great Commission. We have to remind ourselves on a consistent basis, the, 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 only clear, the only command in there is to make disciples. As you're going, make disciples. You see, we may be faithful to go, we may be faithful to baptize, we may be faithful to teach, but if we don't make disciples, who also make disciples, our effectiveness will end after one generation. There are a lot of churches, they do really good at, at going and, and winning people to Christ and baptizing them, but they're not discipling them and multiplying themselves. We need to do that. Multiply yourself. I mean, that's what Jesus did. Jesus took 12 guys and he just poured himself into them. He, he cloned himself in those 12 men. And what did those 12 men do? They, they turned the world upside down for Christ. You see, there is nothing in the world that excites me more than, than the opportunity to multiply myself as, as a parent. Listen, if you're a parent out here, that ought to be... Your primary purpose in life is to disciple your kids and to multiply yourself in your kids and to see them pursue Christ for the rest of their life. That makes parenting exciting. The anticipation of what God's going to do through that child that you've poured yourself into, how God might use them for the sake of the gospel, that is, to me, the most exciting thing in the world, right? But if you're a parent, that's what you, and I'll drive you to get up in the morning so you, to, to, to disciple and, and to multiply yourself and your kids. But listen to me, every man in here, you ought to multiply yourself. Some of you older men my age and me, meeting age have been down the road a little bit. You need to be finding some younger men and you need to disciple them. Pour, pour yourself into them. Teach them how to, how to have a quiet time. Teach them how to, how, to, how to be a businessman, but to do it in a godly way, and how to be a missionary out in the workplace, out in the marketplace. Don't, don't just live a life. Don't live a life and have a good job and support your family. Have a nice retirement and then just die. Don't just live a life. I'm begging you. Leave a legacy. I'm going to sit down next Tuesday with a young man by the name of Josiah. I, I really got introduced to Josiah on the mission field. Our, our, our church went to, goes to Southwest Africa. And we've been going over there now to, to minister to the Susu people now for good grief, 15 years. I've been over there about seven times. And one of the trips over there, he went with us. And so I got, you get in the mission field, you get to spend some time with people you don't normally get to, to know or to meet. And, I got to invest him on that trip, and we developed a relationship, and I began to invest in his life, and we got together when we got back on a regular base, basis, and I would give him books to read and challenge him in his spiritual growth. Josiah, now this has probably been, I'm, I'm guessing maybe six or seven years ago. Josiah is now a student at Southeastern. He's finishing up his master's. We're going to meet next Tuesday morning for breakfast, and he wants to talk about, he wants to be in full-time ministry by next December. My ministry is going to outdistance my life and his life. Matt Johnson was at our church Wednesday night, another young man that's in, in seminary. A man I've had an opportunity to, to, to pour into and to, to disciple and to multiply myself. If you're a man, listen to me, I promise you, if you're an older gentleman, there are young men in this church that hunger, hunger for an older guy to come near them and put their arm around him and say, hey man, how about we hang out once in a while and I'd love to just spend some time with you and, and help you with your walk with God. 
or help his, a young father to, to, to really know how to be a good daddy and a godly daddy and how to disciple his kids. Am I tracking with anybody? Multiply yourself as a dad. Women, if you're a mother, maybe you're, a, uh, in my, our case, young empty nester, you, you, you ought to be finding some young moms. You have a mops ministry here, heard of mops, mothers of preschoolers, we got one of those. Find one of those mothers of preschoolers just struggling in that phase of life that would love to have a, a mother who's been there, done that, say, hey, can I just meet you for breakfast sometime and just, just encourage you? Begin to multiply yourself. Multiply disciples. There's some couples in here. Like us, you've been married for a couple decades or more. Listen to me, you, you could be pouring into some young couples. Val and I have had the joy of having a couple couples that we meet with on a regular basis come into our home and take them through some marriage studies together and just share from our, our experience as a married couple and where we've failed and where God's blessed and to pour into them. Why? Because we don't even want to live a, live a life just as a married couple, you know. Raise our kids, have a good marriage, retire, and then die. We don't want to just live. We want to leave a legacy. So as a man, as a woman, as a married couple, multiply yourself. Multiply yourself. Leave a legacy. There's a uh, couple slides. I'm just going to gloss over these, but it's Spotswood. And this is our discipleship process. It's too far away for you to see. But at Spotswood, we were really convicted about this. It's probably been a couple years ago, maybe three years ago now. I sat down with the education staff. I said, listen, we need, to, we need to assess our discipleship program and the process that we have and make sure we're doing what we need to do and we're accomplishing what we want to accomplish. And so what we did is we, we blew everything up and we started from ground zero. And we first of all decided, to, looked in Scripture and tried to define together and agree on what a disciple is. What is discipleship? What's it look like? And we had some knock down, drag out discussions about that, but we came to agreement. This is what the Bible says. And, and, so, and it amazes me how many churches have discipleship processes, but they don't even have a clearly defined what a fully grown, mature disciple looks like. You've got to start there, right? I mean, what are, you, what are you shooting at if you don't know what you're shooting at? What's your target? And so we realize, we realize a, a, a fully grown, mature disciple is someone who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit, who uses their spiritual gifts, someone who's plugged into a small group, who's faithful to church attendance, reading their Bible, uh, pray, sharing their faith. We, we had all these things down, and then we decided, okay, this is where we want to get with our people. How do we get there? And so we developed a process to get there from someone who trusted Christ until they were fully grown, uh, developed disciple of Christ. But here's what we realized. In addition to all those things, the most important element of being a fully grown disciple, developed disciple, is that they multiply themselves. In other words, if you're, a, if you're a follower of Christ, I don't care how long you've been saved or how long I've been saved, if you're not multiplying yourself as a disciple, if you're not a disciple who makes disciples, who make disciples, you haven't arrived yet. It's pretty radical for some folks in our church. There are a lot of people in our church that felt like they were mature believers that they had arrived spiritually, that they, they were fully mature disciples. But what they didn't realize is they were missing probably the most important part, which is they were supposed to be multiplying themselves. And so out of that, we realized, man, if I'm going to be challenged by people to multiply themselves, and I better develop a resource or a tool to help them do that. And so we came up with a grounded resource. Long story behind that. I won't spend time on that right now. But God moved through that and so we began to institute that in our church, and now we have ongoing one-on-one -on -one discipleships where people are meeting with younger believers and discipling them through the process at Spotswood, from those from, from, from uh, develop to mature to multiply, and using the books that we got to fit in those. I wish you could take time to share with that, but the key in this is they're learning how to, they need to multiply themselves. So don't just live a life. Leave a legacy. Multiply yourself as a follower of Christ. Let me notice your hand out there. Let me take you through these, the, the adders. You see that adders? Teach, multipliers. Here's something that I've had to kind of drill into my teachers, and that is this. And by the way, at Spotswood, our teachers have three roles. Three roles, R-O-L-E-S. The three roles that they function in, number one's a teacher. We get that, right? If you're teaching a connect group, you're a teacher. Number two, they're a leader. They lead a small group. I get that. But thirdly, they're also a shepherd. They're a shepherd. In fact, I don't care what age group you teach. You perform and function in those three roles. You're a teacher, a leader, and a shepherd. At Spotswood, we have three primary goals in our connect groups. 
transformational teaching, biblical community, missional living. I tell my leaders, that's a win. If those things are happening in your groups, you, that's a win for you. Uh, I just enlisted a new leader this past week, sat him down, was talking to him, explained to him. It's not complicated. We keep it as simple as possible. It's possible. We just have three goals. Transformational teaching to take place. We teach for transformation, not information. We want life change. Biblical communities developed. We want our people to, in Acts chapter 2 to love on each other, to care for one another, to minister to each other, that a biblical community is developed and nurtured in that group. And then thirdly, that missional living is, is modeled by you and encouraged and challenged by you within, within the group members. You see, at Spotswood, every one of our members is a missionary where they work, live, and play. And so those three functions that we talked about, the three roles correlate with each of those. A teacher teaches towards uh, teaching for transformation, transformational teaching. A leader leads towards missional living. And a shepherd shepherds towards biblical community. So you need all three roles. But then in addition to that, I reminded all our leaders, every one of you is a discipler primarily. Even though you're a leader and a teacher and a shepherd, your primary role is a discipler. Every time I get together and I train my leaders, every, we meet three times a year, I train all three of those things. I just met with them last Sunday night. I either give them a resource, we do our training that night specifically towards one of those roles. This past Sunday night, I spent some time, I gave them a resource on teaching to help them become a better teacher. I gave them another resource on leading to help them grow as a leader, and then I spent the rest of the time teaching them on shepherding their connect group. But in the midst of that, I reminded him, don't forget that your primary role is a discipler. What you're really doing in that connect group is you're discipling that group. It really does kind of change your mindset as a teacher. When I sit down on Sunday morning, I look around that circle of young empty nesters, 1130. I, I, I find myself as not, not teaching them. I'm a discipler. As a discipler, it changes my mindset. Because now when I walk in there, it's not about just teaching a lesson. It's about seeing each one of those individuals mature in their faith. Seeing them move to the next step in their spiritual growth. Seeing their marriages become more godly. Seeing them begin to live as missionaries where they live, work, live, and play. Seeing men begin to have a quiet time. Does that make sense? So it's not just about a lesson. It's much bigger than that. It's much more important than that. And it's much more exciting. So what you ought to do as a teacher, you teach towards discipleship. You lead towards discipleship. You shepherd towards discipleship. So what drives me as a teacher is discipling my people. What drives me as a leader is leading my people, discipling them as a leader. What drives me as a shepherd is loving on them and caring for them. Why? Because I want to disciple them. If you're a preschool teacher, that's what you are. You're not teaching preschoolers. Yeah, you're, you, you had that role, but your primary role is to disciple those preschoolers to disciple them to Jesus, and to disciple them in their growth in Jesus. I don't know about you, but that makes being a connect group leader <coughs> way more exciting. Yeah, it's exciting to teach a group, but it's way more exciting to disciple a group. To multiply myself in each one of those people in that class as a follower of Christ. That's what we do. So notice if you have that mindset, what will happen? Notice on your sheet there, adders, teach, multipliers, disciple. Hey, we need adders, that's great. If you want to be an adder, that's fine. I'm not, you're not a bad person, but you're missing out. That's all I'm saying, you're missing out. At Spotswood, if you, if you looked at our 50 plus connect group in our adult area, you're going to find some adders. They're, they're good people. They, they teach their group faithfully. I, I, I'm not going to condemn them but my heart breaks for them because they're missing out on the joy of being multipliers, of truly seeing life change and multiplying themselves. No, next there, adders prepare lessons, multipliers prepare lives. That's the difference between just being a teacher and being a discipler and being a multiplier. Your focus, if you, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's some of you, your focus every week is just on preparing a lesson, but when you become a discipler, it's bigger than that. It's about seeing God's word change lives, and your focus is not on the lesson, it's on lives. Next, the adders focus on Sunday, multipliers focus on the rest of the week. Adders focus on Sunday, multipliers focus on the rest of the week. You see, my burden is not just what happens on Sunday morning. If that's all I was was a teacher, that's all my concern would be, what takes place in the class. I'm successful if I got through the lesson, I taught the lesson, that's a win. But if you're a discipler, it doesn't stop there. A win for me is to see them 
put into practice what they learned on Sunday on Monday morning. The difference between an adder and a multiplier. Next, adders invite people to their class. Multipliers invite people to their lives. Here's a guy in my connect group. His name is Bryce. Pray for Bryce if God brings him to mind. He just, a lot of folks in our church are men. They work in D.C. and they, they work for contractors, right? And there are times when the contract's run out and they aren't renewed and all these men are in those situations. They lose their jobs until they can find another company or another contract. Bryce is in that position right now. And so he's looking for a job. But Bryce is in my group. He's in my connect group, my adult connect group, Young Empty Nesters, 1130. But in addition to that, he teaches a 12th grade boys, 12th grade men's connect group. He's, he's not just a teacher. <coughs> he's a multiplier. You know how I know that? Because he doesn't just invite 12th grade boys to his class. He invites 12th grade boys into his life. It's not unusual to see, hear from Bryce and say, yeah, I went on a camping trip with my guys or... Yeah, we got together and had dinner together, or, or we did this together during the week. He spends time with them. Because you do know if you're going to disciple somebody, you're going to have to, it's messy, right? You got to let them into your life. But listen, by having these couples come into our home, sometimes it's a little messy. Sometimes our house is messy, right? Sometimes they're going to see the mess in your life. But for them to, to, to really grow and mature and for you to be able to pour into them and multiply yourself, you got to be willing to invite people into your life. So that means as a connect group leader, no matter what age you teach, that means you're going to get with, your, get with your people as much as possible outside of Sunday so you can get to know them. So you can really begin to disciple them. This one in on your hand, in on your handout. This is a kind of throw it in for free, right? Here it goes. Adders invite people to their class. Multipliers invite people to leave their class. Adders invite people to their class. Multipliers, people are really discipling. They ask people to leave their class. I get it. I teach, a, I teach a group, right? I teach a connect group. I don't like the idea of people leaving my group. But it needs to happen. There's a lady in our group, Doreen, Darlene. Uh, Darlene's working on her, on her EDD. Sharp, sharp young lady. Was, uh, was in the military, retired from the military. And she was in our connect group. I remember when she first came, she's single, and she came into our, adult, our Young Empty Nesters Connect group. She was, she was a great person, loved having her in her group, and then she surrendered to teach high school girls. But you know what? That was awesome. It was tough as a Connect group leader, realized she's not going to be in our group anymore, because now she teaches 1130. But what a joy now to see her multiplying herself in the life of these teenage girls. I discipled her and poured into her, and now she's left our class to teach. And we got a number of people that you send, you send people out to teach. If you teach, in a, if you teach listen to me, if you teach an adult connect group, and the, and the same people in your group today that were there three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, you're missing out. They should be leaving your group. Because if you're, really, if you're doing more than just teaching, you're discipling them, that means they're going to begin to discover their spiritual gifts. And they're going to begin to realize, you know what, I should be doing this. And they should be leaving your class to go serve in other parts of the area. By the way, this is a little side note. Where, where are preschool, children's, and student connect group leaders going to come from? Our groups. And so it's a challenge to me as a connect group leader to disciple my people, my group, because some of them are future preschool, children's, and student connect group leaders. So I want to pour into them, and I want to teach them and disciple them so someday they're ready to go teach a group. Are you with me? Am I making sense? All right. Let me give number two. Number one, we need to multiply disciples. And again, I keep saying it's true. Don't let the sum total of your ministry as a connect group leader. Just inviting people to come here, you talk. Be a multiplier. Number two, we need to multiply leaders. Verse of Scripture there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Verse two. Most of us are familiar with the passage of Scripture where Paul tells Timothy to teach other men who will what? Go and teach other men. Timothy, you need to multiply yourself as a leader. And you and I as leaders, as connect group leaders, need to multiply ourselves the question that really drives me in my ministry and really in my life is this question. It's up on the screen. How do I maximize the time I have left? How can I have the most influence for Christ? I, you know, I'm, I'm 50, 50 plus, right? I don't know how many more years I've got to serve the Lord. So I want to make sure the remaining years I have make the greatest impact as possible for the kingdom, which leads me to this little acronym, MKI, Maximum Kingdom Impact. I want my life to have maximum kingdom impact. 
you know what, I know, I know this, this is, I, it's got to be true. If I were to walk around the room and I were to walk to each one of you and just pull you to the side and ask you seriously, seriously, do you really want to have maximum kingdom impact? Do you want your life to matter as much as possible for, for God and for the sake of the kingdom? If I were to ask you that one-on-one, I guarantee you probably, probably everybody in this room would say, yeah, I would. I really would. I want my life to have maximum kingdom impact. If you do, then multiply yourself. Multiply yourself. As I said earlier, clone yourself. Wherever you teach, find somebody to pull alongside and make them your apprentice. In spots that we don't have substitute teachers, they're called apprentices. You should have an apprentice. If you're a preschool teacher, you gotta have an apprentice. If you're a children's teacher, you gotta have an apprentice. If you're a student teacher, you gotta have an apprentice. No matter what you do, I don't care what ministry you're in. If you're a greeter, go find somebody else to greet with you and make them, help them learn how to greet. Clone yourself. If everybody does that, you'd never have any trouble finding additional workers, would you? If every servant, if, if, if everybody in ministry, no matter where you serve, just found somebody else to pull alongside and just cloned yourself, imagine the difference we can make. But personally, the impact you can make for the kingdom Notice on your sheet there, an adder has a substitute teacher, a multiplier has an apprentice. In Richmond, we have uh, our uh, International Mission Board. That's only 50 miles south of us, so we have a great relationship with the Mission Board. We have a number of men who've come up to speak. One of them is Gordon Fort. Gordon Fort is a vice president at the International Mission Board. He's spoken at our church a number of times, a really good friend of our pastor, great guy. Um, he made this statement one time on a Wednesday night. It's been a couple years ago. He said this, he said, you're not serious about missions. He said, you're not serious about missions if you don't have a passport. What he's saying is, don't come up and tell me, yeah, Mr. Ford, I, I'm, I'm really excited about missions and, and I, I want to go on a mission trip. If you don't have a passport, you're not that serious. And by the way, you ought to have a passport. So when God tugs you on the shoulder about going on a mission trip, you're ready to go. But listen to me, don't tell me you're serious about having maximum kingdom impact. Don't tell me you're serious about being a multiplier if you don't have an apprentice. You're not serious until you have an apprentice. And I know, and we may get into some of this a little bit later, but you may say, well, man, I, I, don't, I don't have any in my group right now that I, I could really make an apprentice with me in my group. And that may be your situation. You look at your group members, I don't have anybody ready to step into that role of an apprentice. Or maybe you're a preschool teacher. You don't even have a clue who to ask. Just pray. Just pray. As I, as I was leading my Connect group, our Connect group's about two and a half years old. Maybe three. Close to three. And we've experienced that. We haven't birthed the group yet. I was really struggling to find them. All the guys that qualified as apprentices were already teaching in other areas. Already serving in other areas in our Connect group ministry. I was getting frustrated, so I began to pray. What's really interesting, we, we, uh, we just birthed a church about 16 miles south of us in Ladysmith, Virginia. If you've ever driven up 95, you went right by Ladysmith, Virginia. Caroline County has 30,000 people. There's really not a strong gospel witness in that whole county. A lot of struggling churches, but nothing really happened. So we, we felt called to birth a church. We sent about 150, 200 people down there in September. We got a, they meet in a school. Things are going really good, but we lost a lot of leaders. In fact, we lost, I think, 40 Connect Group leaders. Imagine what happened to your church if you lost 40 Connect Group leaders, just got up and left. And they all went to serve at this new church plan. And so we realized we need to do something quick, right? So in March, we decided to have a campaign. We called it Bigger Than Me. Drew preached on for four Sundays. He took four, ish, four things that kept people from teaching. Uh, my past, I can't teach because of my past. I can't teach because I'm not able, whatever it was. And he showed from the scripture, from biblical illustrations of people that God used, how that God overcomes those things. At the end of March, we had 220 people surrender to be Connect Group leaders. Folks, that is a miracle. 220 people said, you know what, I'll be a Connect Group with preschool, children, and God just, it just shows what happened when you multiply yourself as a church, how God always multiplied. We lost 40, we gained 220. One of those is a man by the name of John King. Here I am as a Connect Group leader. I said, God, I need, a, I need an apprentice. I need you to send one. John and his wife Faith surrendered to be adult Connect Group leaders in the midst of that campaign. One Sunday out of the blue, John showed up in our Connect Group. 
found out a little over a year ago. God sent, sent him right to our group. In March of this year, a year later, John's going to be birthing a group out of our group. We've been through the process. We'll talk about it a little bit later, maybe if we have time, but we're birthing a new group. We're going to send out, our goal is to send out a minimum of 12 people with John in faith to birth this new group. So pray. Pray. Say, God, I want to multiply myself. I want to have maximum kingdom impact. Would you send me somebody that I can pour into? Someone I can clone myself. Leaders. Number, next on that, adders teach, less, teach every lesson a multiplier lets his apprentices teach when he's, even when he's there. Last Sunday, I was in connect group, but I didn't teach. John taught. Why? Because how am I going to help John become a better teacher if I don't hear him teach? So that means there's going to be Sundays next Sunday. Uh, next month, he'll teach two Sundays. Uh, one of the Sundays, I won't be there. The other Sunday, I will be there. So when you have an apprentice, don't just use them when you're not there. Use them when they're there. So you can help them grow and mature as a leader. Next, adders focus on bringing people in. A multiplier focuses on sending people out. Adders focus on bringing people in. Multipliers focus on sending people out. Next, an adder adds followers. A multiplier multiplies leaders. I wish you had time to talk about this illustration more, but there's an illustration of leadership found in what we call the banyan tree. The banyan tree. Has anybody ever seen a banyan tree? This is a picture of a banyan tree. It's an amazing tree. It gets large enough, it'll cover an acre. But nothing can grow under it. There's no foliage under it. But it's a massive tree. It's a very impressive tree. On the flip side, it has a banana tree. A banana tree, every six months, it shoots up. Shoots shoot up. Every 18 months, it bears fruit. But a banana tree, it, it'll, it'll multiply itself so quickly within, within, I think it'll a period of time, six months or so. It'll cover an acre. It's crazy how fast it multiplies itself. But there's a leadership principle found in this. Mitsuo Fukuda. It's a guy's name. This is what he says. He says these two trees, especially the banyan tree, is, is a great illustration of leadership. He writes this. He says, banyan-style leaders. That's that big tree you saw there, right? Banyan-style leaders have a tremendous ministry but have difficult finding a successor because they do not generate leaders, only followers. It's possible to grow followers in a relatively short space of time, and that's a useful result on its own. But when the leader goes away, you're left only with a heavily dependent group of people programmed with a list of instructions. That's Banyan-style leadership. We need banana-style leaders, right? To multiply themselves. Listen, if you're a leader and, 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 you, and, you, and you were to leave your position and everything would just fall apart, you're not a very good leader. A successful leader is someone who can leave their position of leadership and everything just goes on fine. Because they've multiplied themselves. They've cloned themselves. There are people they've poured into who know exactly what to do. And they can carry the banner and move forward. Next, to notice groups is the third thing we need to multiply, not just disciples, but also leaders. But finally, notice groups. Exodus 18 is one of the greatest passages of Scripture dealing with multiplying groups. You all remember the story of Moses? And he was struggling trying to minister to all these people. And then his father-in-law showed up. And his father-in-law, Jethro, said, Listen, Moses, what you need to do is you need to break your, all these people into small groups. It was the first small group ministry. Enlist some small group leaders. Help them care for those folks. And your ministry will, will exponentially grow through their, through their ministry. That was the first small group ministry. Groups, the multiplication of groups. Three vital relationships happen. Notice on your sheet, three vital relationships happen when you multiply groups. Intimacy with God grows when you multiply groups. Because anytime time you get involved in kingdom work and you find yourself being obedient to what God tells you to do, you grow closer to the Lord. It's a natural result. Your community uh, with insiders grows. Intimacy with God, community with insiders. Again, small groups, the more small groups you have, the smaller the groups are, the stronger the community is. Thirdly, influence with outsider, outsiders grows. You become more missional. There's some multiplication principles, and I don't know if I really have time to talk about these. Let me just touch on them really quickly. For the church to grow, groups must multiply, and that's true. Listen, Franklin Heights Baptist Church is not going to grow unless you multiply groups. We talked about the law of 10, right? The, the, the pyramid principle. As long as you keep the same number of groups you have, you're going to have the same number of people you're reaching until you multiply groups. You've got to multiply groups. For people to grow spiritually, they need to be in, they need to be in community. I illustrated that through that research, through Lifeway. It's a proven fact. Any species that doesn't give birth to a new generation dies. 
When a group has multiplication as its goal, there's an energy. Multiplying in new groups is a reason for apprentices. If you don't have, you're not multiplying groups, you don't have an opportunity for people to step and be, a, be apprentices, to step into leadership roles. It's the most effective way to welcome more people into the Christian community. The most satisfying accomplishment of a small group leadership. And then last of all, full potential is reached by the leader. Let me get into the how. Let me get into nuts and bolts really quickly, and then we'll wrap this up. And this next part I'm going to share with you is probably the most important part. So just, just listen to me. Don't, don't zone out yet. Just listen to me for a few more minutes, because this next part is probably the most important part. In, in order for multiplication to happen in, in, in your life and mine, in, in order for multiplication to happen in your church and my church, there's some things that got to take place. There's some changes that have to take place. Notice on your sheet, the first change that needs to take place is our assessment. Our assessment. By that, I mean what we value. When we begin to focus on, on the kingdom of God, when, when we begin to focus on, on, on eternity, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, look it up later. When Paul said, you know, seek those things which, which are above, not those things which are below. Set your affections on the things which are above. Do you know why people don't, Christians don't multiply? Do you, know why when I, do you know why there are times when I struggle with multiplication? You know what the issue is? It's because my kingdom is more important than God's kingdom. Because multiplication is hard. Multiplication is messy. Multiplication, sometimes it hurts. But if I really value God's kingdom, if the gospel is the most important thing in my life, then i got to multiply. Because that's the way I'm going to have the maximum kingdom impact. So the question you and I have to struggle with right off the bat is this, how important is God's kingdom to us? Because until you settle that, until you change your assessment, you'll never be a multiplier. Because it's too hard. It costs too much. But when you begin to value the kingdom, I mean, really value the kingdom. Do you remember the, 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 the parable that Jesus told about the guy that found, do you remember the pearl of great price in the field? Do you remember that story? He dug it, he found it. What did he go do? He went and sold everything he had to buy that field because it was so valuable to him what was in that field. When, when, you, when you get consumed with the gospel, When you really get burdened, how many of you are doing um, Explore the Bible? Anybody doing Explore the Bible in here? Explore the Bible, you're going to be, we're a week behind Explore the Bible. We're, we're just moving into Acts chapter 17. You remember when Paul ended up in Athens? Remember when he preached that great sermon, Mars Hill? If you read the beginning of that passage, when he entered into Athens, he began to walk around and see all those idols, right, and all those statues. Don't miss what it says in there. He was tore up inside. It broke his heart. It motivated Paul to do some crazy stuff. I mean, how can the Apostle Paul and all he endured for the sake of the gospel, the price he paid, that guy was stoned until, as far as we know, he was killed. And then when he rose back up, what did he do? He went back into the same city that stoned him. Isn't that crazy? But you know why? Because the kingdom was that important to him. There was nothing going to stop him. We've got to change our assessment. So listen to me. For some of you who really struggle right now, saying, I don't know if I'm really a birth of group. And I'll be honest with you. I'm getting ready to birth a group in March, and it hurts. In the flesh, I don't want to do it. Because I'm going to say goodbye to at least a dozen or more of the, my, I love them, my connect group, your family. But if the kingdom of God is important to me, then i got to do it. I remember telling my group that last week. Hey, guys, it hurts. But you know what? I love God's kingdom more than my kingdom. It's not about me building my kingdom. It's about me building his kingdom. And it's because of that, I need some of you to leave. So some of you need to go home and get alone with God and say, God, I need to value your kingdom more. I need to value your kingdom more. Value your kingdom enough that it'll drive me, it'll drive me to do some things that just don't make sense to the world and even to other believers. What, you're going to birth a group? Yeah. What, you got an apprentice? 
because the kingdom is important to me. Number two, it will change our attitude, how we think. Not, not, once we begin to focus on eternity and we get burdened about eternity, we get burdened about the kingdom, then we begin to live for eternity, live for the kingdom. Philippians chapter 3, 13 through 14, Paul says, I press forward to those things which are before. It consumed him. He lived for that. So once you change your assessment, you begin to make, it, it'll, it'll change how you live. It'll change how you function as a connect group leader. You'll stop being an adder. It won't, it'll stop being about how many's in your class. It'll be more about how many leave your class. It'll be all about, man, I've got to birth the group because I want to multiply my group because I want to reach more people. I want to make a difference for the kingdom. And then thirdly, it'll change our actions, what we do. We'll invest in eternity. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, lay up your treasures in heaven, right? Moth and rust, that's not corrupt. We begin to invest in the kingdom. So those three things right there are probably the most important thing you'll struggle with tonight. You've got to change your assessment. You've got to change your attitude, which ultimately lead to a change of your actions, and you'll become a multiplier. So how do we do it? How do we multiply disciples? Notice on your sheet there, first of all, multiply disciples. Number one, multipliers don't just teach lessons, they teach people. We're almost done. But when you, when you become a discipler and a multiplier as a teacher, again, you, your focus as you teach is not on your lesson anymore. You, you, find yourself, you find yourself looking at the people you're teaching and thinking about them as you're teaching. Because in reality, you're not teaching a lesson. You're teaching the people. So, so even as I'm teaching, as we're teaching through the book of Acts, and, and even as I'm preparing, I'm not preparing a lesson, I'm, I'm thinking about people. So you begin to look at, you, you begin to look, I, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, on Ron or, 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 or Brad or, or, or Michelle or, or, or Tammy, or, and I'm, I'm thinking about them. Next, uh, multipliers don't just know lessons, outlines, but they know students' lives. I promise you if, you, if you begin to become a multiplier, if you really begin to focus on discipling your people, then you're, you're going to start wanting to know more about them. You're going to want to be able, you want to get, to know them and their lives, what's going on in their lives. Next, teachers teach with passion but with power. Mul uh, multipliers don't just teach with passion but with power. Here's what's really cool. When you become a multiplier and you have this drive to want to see, to really to disciple and see life change and, and, and to see the people in your small group, I don't care if it's preschool through adult, whatever age it is, to really see them begin to apply God's truth to their lives and to grow and, and to see you, you begin to clone yourself in them as a disciple. When you really desire that, you're going to realize you can't do it. You, you need God's help. Because only God brings about life change, right? You know what's going to find yourself doing? You're going to find yourself throughout the week as you prepare your lesson crying out to God saying, God, I, I, I need your help. I need the Holy Spirit's enablement. I need the Holy Spirit to fill me as I teach, to fill me as I minister. Man, if I'm teaching preschoolers, I'm going to spend time on my knees praying for each one of those preschoolers that God would touch their lives and, and, and someday they would come to know Jesus or children or students or adults. God, th those couples in my, in, my, in my small group, God touched their marriages. Listen, I'm, I'm to the point in my, in my pilgrimage as a follower of Christ, my pilgrimage as a connect group leader, I, I'm not satisfied with what Dan Cook can do because I'm not, I'm not really impressed with what Dan Cook can do. I, I've seen that. I've seen what I can accomplish as a connect group leader. It's not much. What I desperately want as a connect group leader is for God to break through in my class. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about when you walk away at the end of class and you said, oh my goodness, did you see what God did today? Or when you see, when people come to you in your connect group and, and tell you that, yeah, I started reading my Bible every day. Or, hey, I shared my faith at work. Or, hey, I believe God wants me to teach a children's connect group or a student's connect group. Or, hey, I'm getting plugged in this ministry. You can look at it and say, look what God did. She said, that's what I want in my group. I, I, want to, I want to see God at work. I want God to break through in the students' lives. I want God to break through in their marriages. I can't do that. So that drives me to my knees. That means I plead and I beg God and the Holy Spirit to fill me as I teach and as I minister. I'm telling you, when you become a multiplier, it will change your life. Some of you out there, you've been there. You, you know, you're tired of the same old, same old. Then become a multiplier. And cry out to God for God to do something in your group to break through. Oh my goodness, almost done. 
Teach, uh, multipliers don't just teach students, but teach missionaries. You see, when I'm a discipler, I, I, one of the things I do as a discipler, disciple my students and my connect group, I'm not just teaching the lesson. I, I'm, 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 I'm talking to missionaries. Every one of my people in my group's a missionary. You, you do understand you're a missionary, right? If you're a follower of Christ, you are a missionary. You, you may not be a good one, but you're, you're a missionary. Where you work, live, and play. Your home is a missionary outpost. I remember as a church, we struggled with this question probably about 10 years ago. If our church disappeared tomorrow, who would miss us? It broke our hearts. Because we realized the only people who would miss Spotswood Baptist Church at that time, and we, we thought we were a healthy church, growing church, the only people who would miss us were other people, other churches that came to see our programs and our people. But Spotsylvania County wouldn't miss us. Public schools wouldn't miss us. Our neighbors wouldn't miss us. And so we got driven. You know what? We need to get off the campus and get out of our neighborhoods. And our... It changed how we did ministry. And then I remember my wife and I struggled with a similar question. We decided, hey, if we disappear tomorrow, if the Cook family disappeared off of Watford Lane, who would miss us? Who would miss you in your neighborhood? It'll change how you live. We asked ourselves this question, hey, if the Internet, not the International Mission, North American Mission Board planted us as church planters at 10, 5, 10 Watford Lane, would we be li living any differently than we are right now? Well, if you're a church planter, what are you going to be doing in your neighborhood? You're going to be developing relationships. You're going to be trying to reach people, right? <coughs> Listen, we realize that North American Mission Board didn't plant us there. A higher agency did, heaven itself. We're at 10, 5, 10 Watford Lane providentially. We're a missionary outpost. It drove us in to develop relationships with our neighbors so we could build a relationship that would, a relational bridge that would bear the weight of the gospel. And we've seen neighbors come to Christ, get baptized, serve in the church, because that's our mission field. And by the way, your neighborhood's your mission field. You're a missionary where you work, live, and play. And every day, think about this, every single day is what? It's a mission trip. Anybody been on a mission trip? Seriously, anybody on a mission trip overseas? You ever notice how people live differently on a mission trip? I've been about 10 mission trips, been to Africa, China, Japan. Every time I go on a mission trip with people, when they go on a mission field, they're radically different. They live at home. I remember in Africa, I get up early in the morning with my flashlight to go read my Bible. And when I get out there, I realize everybody else is out there with their flashlight reading their Bible. And I know they don't do that at home, right? But they're doing it there. They're reading their Bible and they're praying. Why? Because they're on a mission trip. Why? Because they want God to use them. And, and you're on a mission trip. When plans change, people, nobody gets upset. It's okay, I'm on a mission trip. God's at work. I can't wait to see what he's going to do. And they're burdened because they want to see people come to Christ. There's an expectation for God to work because I'm on a mission trip. Every single day when you wake up, you're going on a mission trip because you're a missionary. That means every single day it ought to drive you to your knees. Grab your flashlight, grab your Bible. Why? Because you want God to use you that day. And when plans change during the day, you don't get upset because you're on a mission trip. That just means God's got something in store for you around the corner. That means you walk through the day burdened to see the people around you come to Christ. Why? Because you're on a mission trip. And that means that every time your small group meets, it's a mission team report. Ever seen mission teams? They come back and they give a report, right? Everybody said, hey, this is what God did on the mission trip. Every Sunday morning, you ought to have your team. Okay, everybody, we're on a mission trip this week. Somebody tell me, what did God do on your mission trip this week? Every week ought to be that way. So the people get to understand, that's right, we're on a mission trip, and this is what, and then you begin to hear stories where God used people to share their faith at work or in their neighborhood. It's a mission team report. You're teaching missionaries. I've got like three minutes. The next thing is leaders. How do you, in, in, how do you enlist leaders? Number one, you, you got the word I use, or I use the word entreat. That's just another word for pray. You got to pray. Again, to pray for an apprentice. Pray to God will raise up a person. If you want to, listen, if you're a man in here and you want to have a, you're looking for a young man to, to, to pour your life into, just pray. Say, God, send me across the path of somebody, and maybe a, a believer at work or a believer here at church, but a young man who just needs somebody to pour into him, a young believer. Same with the ladies looking for another lady or a young mother. You enlist them. You enlist them. Whenever you enlist a new leader, always do it in person. Don't do it by email. Don't do it by phone. You see, if you believe the responsibility is important, and it is important, then recruit like it is. Recruit like it is. I don't ever recruit a leader over the phone. I don't recruit them over the, uh, the email. 
we meet together over coffee, we meet in my office, we meet somewhere, and we sit down, we talk about it because it's important. If it's important, then recruit like it is. Next, equip them, train them, pour into them, give them resources, model how it's done right. And by the way, almost done, that's why we use curriculum. Some of you may wonder, why do we use Explore the Bible? Why do we have curriculum? You know, I, I, I'm seminary trained. I've got 136 hours of seminary training, graduate work. I have a doctoral degree, an ADD. I think I could write my own stuff. But just like every other Connect Group leader, I use Explore the Bible. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because I'm trying to multiply myself. And so that means I, I go up to John. I say, John, I need you to teach next week. And I hand him a leader's guide. I say, dude, it's not that hard. There's a leader's guide. Same thing I use. I, in other words, I want people out there to sit there watching me teach and knowing what I, resource I have. And I want them to be thinking in their head, I could do that. But if I wrote my own stuff and impressed them with whatever ability I might think I have, everybody's going to be sitting there thinking what? I can never do that. I'd never multiply myself. So next time you find yourself complaining about the curriculum, stop yourself and realize it's not about you. The reason you use curriculum is so you can multiply yourself as a leader and you want to find a resource and a tool that's easy for somebody else to use. It's bigger than you. Does that make sense? So that's why I require all my leaders to use, to use Explore the Bible. Use curriculum. So I've got retired pastors, men who could do their own thing. I tell them, I'm sure you could, but then you're just going to be an adder. I want you to be a multiplier. So use a tool that anybody could use. And then empower them. Send them out. Send them out. There, we're, going to stop, we're going to basically stop here. Do you notice that last thing about groups? We've talked a lot about groups. You notice the, uh, on your handout there, develop a missional mindset. Um, we could do literally every one of these sections, I could spend hours talking about these. And I have in the past with my leaders. But developing a missional mindset is important for your group if you're ever going to birth new groups. And that's where the, you become outward focus, not just inward focus. Every, Every group starts out as a class, it becomes a community as they get you to know one another. See that graph, that diagram in there? I think it might be on the PowerPoint, babe, if you go forward. Right there it is. Eventually you want to you leverage that community for the sake of the gospel, and so they begin to think outward. Um, I did a two, the time before last leadership meeting, we talked about leadership and how to have a missional group and how to lead towards a missional group. Um, if you notice, I have it up there too about the, uh, the leader roles, that's also on there. But what you got to do, and number, notice number two, you got to talk about multiplication as if, if it's a given. And you start talking about it in your group. You see, multiplying group, it's just like we talk about, we compare it to giving birth. I've never given birth, okay? I don't know everything about it, right? But I've been there when it happened, and I know it didn't just happen. There was a nine month process. Same is true with birthing a group. You're not going to go birth a group next week. You got to start. It's been a year. It took a year of preparation for us to birth this group. I had to find a leader, I had to prepare that leader. I had to prepare my group. And we talk about multiplication in our group like it's a given. It's just what we do. It wasn't like, we, let's pray about it. No, that's just what we do for the sake of the kingdom. So you need to talk about that in your group. Some of you, that may be what you need to start. You need to start talking about, you know what? We need to multiply. And we need to pray that God will send us an apprentice and just start praying. But then you prepare that leader. You let them teach in your group. And then you send them out with people in your group. I've never, I've birthed probably 12 or 13 groups over my experience in 23 years at Spotswood. We've never sent out less than 12. God just... It's amazing how God touches people's hearts. Um, what we do, we'll be doing this in a few weeks. We'll be sending three by five cards to the whole, everybody in the group. And they'll write yes, no, or maybe. Yes, I'm going to be part of the new group with John and Faith. No, I'm going to stay in this group. And maybe we're still praying about it. Collect all the yes cards, give them to John. Say, John, contact him. Remind him where you're going to be meeting. We'll birth new groups. Listen, you can be a multiplier. As a man, as, as a woman, as a follower of Christ, as a... A, a couple and as a leader and as a group you can be multipliers my plea to you is just don't live a life leave a legacy don't let the sum total of your ministry here simply be that you gathered people together to hear you talk leave a legacy make an impact for the kingdom make an impact for the kingdom let me close with this poem I came across this um, a short while ago. Where is it? There it is. It says, one man awake can awaken another. The second can awaken his next door brother. The three awake can rouse a, a town by turning the whole place upside down. 
The many awake can make such a fuss that it finally wakens the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes multiplies. Heavenly Father, I pray for each of these leaders right here. Lord, I pray that you'll change our assessment. That, Father, we will so value the kingdom of God. That, Father, we'll so value the gospel that it will drive us to multiplication. That, Lord, it will so motivate us as a man to find a younger man, as a woman to find a younger woman, as a couple to find another younger couple. That motivate us as a, as a follower of Christ, as a connect group leader, to say, hey, I want to have maximum kingdom impact. I value the kingdom so much more than my kingdom. I'm willing to make the sacrifice. I'm willing to make the effort. I'm willing to, 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 to suffer whatever's necessary so I can clone myself, so I can make a, a bigger impact for the kingdom of God. Lord, help us to change our assessment. Which, Lord, will change Lord, how we think, which Lord will change what we do. Lord, if just one person, just one person in here, Lord, to say, you know what, I, I, I'll do that. I'm going to find an apprentice. I want to multiply my life. I, I, I don't want to just live a life. I want to leave a legacy. I want my ministry to outdistance my life. Lord, I pray you call men and women to do that tonight. Lord, give us a burden that will drive us to our knees to pray that you'll send people to us that we can invest in. Drive us to our knees to pray that you'll empower us through your Holy Spirit to do what you call us to do as disciples, which is to multiply ourselves. And then, Father, I believe that you'll do something far beyond we could ever imagine or think as we just simply surrender to you and allow you to work through us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.